Well, this morning we are in the second week of a series of messages that we are calling Life with the Living God, in which we are exploring some of the key characteristics of our living triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Last week, we began the series by, first of all, understanding that we have a God who who speaks, a God who speaks, and that word accomplishes something. We see it in the beginning in Genesis. We see it in the calling of Abraham and Moses, and we see it first and or we see it foremost in the word made flesh who dwells among us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Last week, then, we asked a question as we think about that God who speaks, realizing he still speaks this very day, to realize we have a a prayer we can pray or a question we can ask each day of our life as we take that next step of following Jesus. And that question is simply this, Jesus, where are you speaking in my life? That where may be another person, perhaps a a beloved spouse or or, or even a child or a grandchild. That might be through the scripture you heard read this morning or the hymn that you just heard sung. It certainly will be at the table this day, present in his body and blood and present too as we share this message this morning. These places, Jesus is speaking into our lives, guiding us, directing us, helping us to take that next step of following him. Now, if you missed any of the message, that first message in the series, I encourage you to, to go and watch it on our website, stpaultexas.com. Stay connected to, too, if you get the e-news on, on Wednesday. I, I know a lot of people, if they missed a sermon, they click it on there. Uh, and if you don't get that e-news, make sure you're getting that from us, because as this sermon series is preparing us for the, for the next sermon series, which is going to last us 14 months as we go into the Bible binge, an opportunity to look at the whole counsel of God that this sermon series is preparing us for, so make sure we get your email so that you're getting all those resources that will come starting the end of October. Now, now today, as we continue in, in this series, we have a God who speaks, and today we're talking about a God who forms, the God who forms. Now, you were given something, hopefully you got one when you came in this morning. I don't know when the last time it was that you played with Play-Doh, but, but you can get your Play-Doh out during the sermon today because I want you to kind of think about that as a, a kind of an illustration as what we're going to look at here in a moment uh, in the scriptures. Now, when you think about Play-Doh, you think about, well, first of all, you think about kids, right? I mean, I don't know the last time you played with Play-Doh or if you are very good at playing with Play-Doh. I was an expert snake builder uh, when I was a kid. I made the best snakes around. Around. Uh, didn't make much more than that. Uh, I saw Pastor last night. He's got, he's got a pretty cool sculpture up here that he did. He is a master Play-Doh player and builder. But if you think about Play-Doh, you're, you play with it in your hands. You form different objects. You can uh, do things with it that, um, you know, are just a fun things to do. Don't mix the colors because then that gets all messy and stuff like that. But, but, but I encourage you to kind of play with that as we talk about the God who forms. Now, of course, the scriptures don't talk about Plato, because Plato wasn't invented back when the Bible was first written, but it does talk about a potter and clay. And if you think about a potter and a clay, that image is in many places throughout the scriptures. Perhaps one of them that, that it sticks out to me the most is from Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, where God declares, but now you, O Lord, you are our father and we are the clay. You are the potter and we are all the work of of your hand. We are the work of your hand. Now, as you do some work with your hands, molding and shaping that Play-Doh into whatever you're going to build out of it, and you can even take it with you if it helps you remember our God is a, is a God who forms, uh, I want to think about that, that image of, of clay and Play-Doh and, well, really the image of that potter and what he does to the clay. I was reminded of this as I was uh, doing some stuff with, with Pastor Justin Rossell, who first kind of reintroduced me to this image and thinking uh, again about perhaps that time, I think it was in high school, and I think it was a little bit in college too, where I had the opportunity to do some pottery. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around people who do pottery as, as a living, but one thing you'll notice about people who do pottery for a living, they've got pretty strong arms. They have really good upper arm strength. And part of that is because how pot, or, or rather how the clay is originally kind of molded and shaped and almost beat by the potter. You ever see that when they get that pottery and they get that clay and they begin to kind of beat it and mold it and try to get all the, the air bubbles out of it? 
It's an important process. Before they even form it into anything else, they got to keep beating it and, and kneading it. And almost sometimes, they sometimes almost even like, they, they, they get like punch it because they're trying to make sure that there's no air bubbles in that clay. Because if there's an air bubble in that clay and they form it into a beautiful pot and they put it in the kiln, what's going to happen is that pot is going to either break or explode. That air will get superheated and it can't contain the clay and it will just blow up. So this important process begins with the potter's hands kneading and mashing and squishing that clay, making sure the air bubbles are all out of it. Now, you know what they do next then is they put that clay on a potter's wheel. And when it's put on that potter's wheel, they, they, they put their hands on that clay, expertly shaping, expertly forming that, that, that pot or that cup or that pitcher, whatever they're going to, to make. There's an image in the mind of the potter as they're doing this. The, the pot isn't doing anything. The pot is just passively receiving the action of the potter upon it and being formed into the image of whatever the potter has in mind. And, and sometimes along the way, the potter will do things that if it was if the clay had any thought that could think of itself would be confusing because the clay, the potter will take things like, like knives and, and they'll, they'll carve things into the, the clay as they move along or they'll, they'll, they'll take pieces of it all off trying to get it into the shape and the form that they're desiring it to be in so that at the end you get something like this, a beautiful, beautiful cup or pitcher formed and made by a potter with a piece of clay, carefully shaped and molded. Now, if you've ever watched a club potter for a while, you know that it doesn't always turn out the way that they want. And when it doesn't turn out the way that they want, the thing the potter can do, there, there's really just two options for the potter. He can either just discard that piece of clay, or he can do something that only you can do before it's, before it's fired. And that's what he does. Look at what he does in Jeremiah chapter 18. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah, and he said, go down to the shop where clay pots and jars are made, and I will speak to you while you are there. So Jeremiah is sent on a field trip to a potter's house. And so Jeremiah went, he did as he told, and he found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So the potter squashed the jar into a lump of clay and started again. Then the Lord gave me this message. O oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to this clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so too you are in my hand. Now, if you're just watching from the outside, you may wonder, why would a potter do that? The pot isn't turning out the way that they intended it to turn out. And so the potter seemingly does something harsh and cruel to that clay in that he smashes it back into a ball again and starts over. And maybe you felt like that sometimes in your life. Like you've been smashed and you've had to start over. And you wondered in those moments, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? And it can feel confusing and it can feel hard. But it's still in the hands of the potter. You see, what would have happened if the potter formed that pot and it didn't turn out the way that, that he intended it? Instead of reforming it, he could have just set it aside. He could have thrown it away. And then it wouldn't be good for anything. But instead of throwing it away, instead of discarding it, he painfully and lovingly takes more time to reform that pot again so that it might do what it had been, what he had in mind for the pot to do all along, forming it and shaping it into something useful so that it can be used by someone else for another purpose. You know, that gives me thinking about what the scriptures say about those things in our life where we feel like we've been squashed, where we feel like we had to start over. And maybe it was something that happened in your family. Maybe it was something that it was a part of your family of origin. Maybe it, was, uh, maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was a death. Maybe it's a diagnosis. And in those moments where, where we get squashed and feels like we're starting over, we can begin to doubt what the potter is doing. But even those things the potter declares to us, even those things we'd prefer not happen to us, can be used for good. 
can be used to form us and to shape us. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And he declares these words, and he says, and we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now understand this, he doesn't say all things are good. No, there are some bad things that have happened to you, and God did not cause that. Could he have prevented it? Yes, but God did not cause that. Part of it's the brokenness of living in this world. Part of it's our own sin. But the good news is no matter how we define it, it can be used in the hand of the potter for something good, for something purposeful. And it doesn't mean that thing that happened to you that was horrible is good. No, it's bad. But in the hands of the potter, in the hands of the master artist, he can use it, he can shape it, he can cause it to be good, use good perhaps for somebody else. You know, we have to remember too, though, sometimes this image of the potter and the clay can break down sometimes too. Because sometimes some of us, I think, are here maybe saying today, well, I don't feel like I'm in the hands of the potter. I feel like I'm just a lump of clay, good for nothing, wondering why I'm still here. And we have to start, first of all, in that starting place to say that just because you're being formed in the hands of the potter and you feel like a lump of clay, you are incredibly loved. You are incredibly valued. The potter incredibly loves you, incredibly values you so much that he came in the work and the person of his son, Jesus Christ, so that through his hands, the blind might see, through his hands, the hungry might eat, through his hands, death would be defeated, and through his hands, there would be hope for all of us. And in the waters of our baptism, we've been joined to Christ in his death and his resurrection. We have been declared to be beloved daughters, treasured sons in whom God is well pleased. We may feel like a lump of clay, but a lump of clay in the hands of the potter is a beautiful thing. A God who loves you with an everlasting love. A God who shapes you and forms you to be used for the benefit of others. You see, this shaping and this forming process isn't to make God love you more. He's already incredibly in love with you. This shaping and this forming, he cannot love you anymore. But he also has a purpose for you. He also can use you for the benefit of those around you. You see, God doesn't shape you into something beautiful like he needs or into the pot for your own sake but for the sake of others. So to think about this, think about this, this discipleship process. It's Justin it Rosso introduced us to us with Robert Mulholland who first said it, that, that the discipleship or, or spiritual formation, that if you think about that, that, that process, it's a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. L- let me break that down and look at some scriptures that go with each one of those. The first thing to, to recognize is, is discipleship's a process. It it takes some time. When Jesus first called his disciples in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 4, verse 18, we read these words. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And they never had another doubt or question about who Jesus is and what Jesus was going to do. They lived pure and righteous lives that nobody would ever doubt that they were followers of Jesus. No, it wasn't a light switch. It was a process. It was a process for three years for the disciples walking with, talking with, eating with Jesus. It was a process that, that continued on after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, a process they continued to walk with, with one another. And they didn't always get it right, but they did it together because they were called into a community with one another because discipleship is a process and we're not going to be completed until the Lord Jesus calls us home and we see him face to face. He's not done with you yet. I hope that's encouraging for some of those who, who perhaps in certain areas of your spiritual walk, you've struggled Maybe you've struggled with prayer. Maybe you struggled with a daily devotion. Maybe you, you struggled with, with, with something else in your walk with, with Jesus. And the good news is, is that even in the midst of that struggle, Jesus is at work. He's in a process. Don't give up. He's still at work in you and through you and with you. And so it's a process. 
And it's a process, not just that. It, what does that process look like? Well, it's a process of being conformed to the image of Christ. I shared Romans 8, 28 earlier to you about that, 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 uh, that, uh, that God can work all things to the good for those who called according to his purpose. Well, right after that verse is verse 29 that says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it too. I'm being conformed to the image of Christ? I mean, pastor, that's kind of a high bar. Jesus is God. I don't think I can do that. And you're right. You won't be God. But he is that image that we are being conformed to, not to perfection, but for the sake of others. And so others need that image of Christ, and we need God to be the one that's conforming us. So it's not us doing it ourselves. It is him who is conforming us, and we receive like the, like the pottery or like the clay being transformed by the potter. We need his work to be the one who's doing the work through us. And that work that he's doing through us is not for our own sake. It is for the sake of others. It is for the sake of the people that God has perfectly positioned into your life to make an eternal differences in the places that you live and work and learn and play. He's not forming you so he's gonna like you better. He already loves you immensely with everlasting love. He's already removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. With you, because of Jesus, he is well pleased. He can't love you anymore. But boy, does he wanna use you. Not to use you, but to work through you for the sake of the people around you. I, I, I love how Ephesians 2 gets, gets at this. And, and as Lutheran Christians, we're really good at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this. Read it with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Already now. Because Christ is united to you in your baptism, you are one in whom the Father is well pleased, period, end of sentence. He cannot love you anymore. He has already loved you with that everlasting love. We get this as Lutheran Christians especially, that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. He does all of the lifting, not just the hefty, heavy lifting, all of the lifting. But we can't stop with verse 9. We need to make Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and 10 again. Because verse 10 is where the fun comes along for you and me. Look at what Paul says. For we are his workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Isn't that awesome? That God in Christ Jesus has already redeemed, redeemed us. He's saved us by grace through faith, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything he's done. But he's given us, prepared us, made us, formed us to be those who are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not to earn our salvation, no. But for the benefit of our neighbor. Martin Luther once said it so well. He said it, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. And oh, does your neighbor need it. Your spouse needs Jesus in you. Your kids and your grandkids need Jesus in you. Your boss needs Jesus in you. Your employees need Jesus in you. Your neighbor needs Jesus in you. Your fellow members in the body of Christ, they need Jesus in you. And Jesus is forming you, crafting you into the image of Christ. Because discipleship is a process of being transformed, conformed rather, to the image of Christ for the sake of others. As we think about that transforming process, one of the questions we want to ask ourselves, it's, it's on the back of your outline on your bulletin to take with you. Last week, we asked the question, Jesus, where are you speaking in my life? And today, we ask the question, Spirit, Spirit, what, are you, what response are you forming in me? It's not me who's figuring it all out. It's not me on my own. God, I believe you are working through me by the power of your Spirit for the sake of others. So what are you putting on my heart? Where have you perfectly positioned me to be able to 
walk in those good works that you've prepared for me to do, not for my sake, but for the sake of my neighbor. Now, as you think about that this week, and I encourage you to think about it, where is that next step he's leading you to? I want you to know that that next step is covered not just by your desire, but it's covered by the word of God. That's where we're going next week even more so. But I want to give you kind of an image of what that looks like. Because while we ask, Jesus, where are you speaking in my like, spirit? What are you forming in me? We also ask the question, God, what, what promise covers my next step? That I'm not just going out willy-nilly, but God, I know your word declares things because you are a God who speaks. So where are your promises that I can cling to to make that next step? And one of the places where we see that forming promise being claimed for us by God is in the Psalms, and especially Psalm 138. And so what I'd love to do here this morning is I I put Psalm 138 as a responsive psalm that that we're going to do here this morning. We're going to start over on on this side. This is going to be the left side, and you over here on the right side. Um, uh, Those of you watching at home, left side is those of you who are watching on Facebook. Right side are those of you watching on YouTube and the website, okay? So everybody got a roll wherever you are. Let's get that first verse on the screen, please, Mike. Psalm 138, starting over here. I'll lead you on the left side. I will give thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. They will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. And altogether, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. There's that promise in the midst of taking that next step. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. You're going to fulfill your purpose in me.